collection. Uh, the race cars, that's what I really do for mm -hmm. life. I, this is my 52nd year of driving racing cars. So if you ask me a question, please speak up because 52 years of an exhaust pipe right here uh, has left me rather incapacitated. Uh, 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 Tell me about it. Yeah. The other thing that I do is I think dinosaur books, uh, which is, you know, I'm still 10 years old. Uh, tonight I want to talk to you about something that uh, uh, is actually a tragedy uh, in our uh, in our life here in, in California and the United States. And that's the uh, earthquake early warning system. I put up here kind of a road map of where I want to go uh, and talk to you tonight. And it also serves as kind of a cheat sheet for me so that I make sure I say everything I need to say. Uh, uh, and to start off with, uh, when People say earthquake early warning. In fact, anybody here uh, given sound bites today about uh, uh, the earthquake early warning system from the USGS? Anybody hear that on the news? They, I listened to KFI and they said it all day long. Anyway, he said, we now have tested and uh, now I think we can have earthquake early warning system. Well, the fact is, it's been off-the-shelf technology for 20 years, and we don't have it. Now, I'll come to the whys of why we don't have it in, in a little bit. But before I start, uh, earthquake early warning versus prediction uh, of earthquakes. We don't have prediction, and we probably will not have earthquake prediction during any of our life and maybe our grandchildren's lifetimes. Why? Because the Earth is a very, very complex organism. And we simply don't know enough. We don't have enough mathematics to be able to figure out these nonlinear systems within the, within the Earth. We can't even tell beyond a 30% chance whether it's going to rain tonight or not, now, let alone predict an earthquake. But what we can have, and do have the capabilities for, is to have a little bit of a warning before the earthquake happens, uh, as far as the strong motion. And most, how many of you are architects, and how many are, how many are architects? Okay, how many are planners? Okay, uh, you lose, when the majority of architects win. Uh, uh, we, uh, 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 we as architects need to be talking to our clients about earthquake early warning. It is no different than this thing right here. Uh, this thing right here uh, and particles of combustion sense something is wrong in our building and it takes an action. And that action is the early warning which allows people to get out there before they die in the fire, uh, like the Great White Fire. Things just didn't work yet. Uh, and early warning is no different than this. It's that simple. It really, really, really is. Now, what I'll talk to you about as we go through is uh, uh, why it's so simple and, uh, and how it can be applied. And every one of you actually should, anybody do hospitals, for instance? Do hospitals, okay? Now, those are <coughs> hospitals or communication centers or police stations or fire stations. Now, now, there are some of these facilities that have earthquake early warning systems in them, but they're standalone. They're not now, regional systems yet. Now, now, the, the next thing that we need to come to is kind of a basic vocabulary. Now, you've all heard of Epicenter, right? Okay, everybody heard of an epicenter? Can somebody tell me what an epicenter is? The center of the day, the core of the day. That's what everybody thinks. It's not. The epicenter is just a point at the Earth's surface that's directly above the center of where the earthquake happens. So the earthquake actually happens down there somewhere. And in California, it's roughly five miles down, plus or minus. You know, some are shallower, some are deeper, but the crust in California is only about 15 miles deep, so it can't get too deep. No, so roughly 
climate event. We have our, uh, our earthquakes. And uh, that, uh, that place where the earthquake actually occurs is called the focus or the hypocenter. And why we have two words for the same thing, I don't know. Uh, that's <coughs> never, not something I've never been able to figure out. Uh, uh, but they both mean the same thing. So uh, if you ever hear of the focus of the earthquake or the, or the uh, hypocenter of the earthquake, that's where the earthquake starts. That's where the first two little grains of, uh, of rock break apart and slide. And from that point, uh, the earthquake propagates. And out of that very first little break, now we have earthquake waves. And these earthquake waves emanate along the fault plane. And maybe I can draw some little pictures, pictures here. If we take a block of earth, and we, and I'm just going to look at this surface right here. So imagine there's another surface on the other side of this. And well, let's see the <coughs> color so we can see that. Okay. There we go. And let's draw this being the focus or the hypocenter. And directly above this, we have the epicenter. So this is the place where the earthquake breaks, right in the very beginning. And then the fault propagates, but we don't understand what would make a fault propagate not maybe a foot, as opposed to 10 miles, as opposed to 100 miles, or 200 miles. And the larger the propagation, generally, the larger the earthquake. And everybody knows how we measure earthquakes? <coughs> Richter. <laughs> magnitude, right, Richter magnitude. Well, we quit doing the Richter magnitude because it really didn't work. It was good for, in 1930 when Charles Richter invented it, but it quickly kind of fell apart when we started recognizing very large earthquakes. 1964 Alaskan earthquake, 19, uh, 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 1960 Chile earthquake, uh, uh, 1960 Peru earthquake, uh, kind of fell apart uh, at that in these very, very large earthquakes. So they had to come up with something else. And before I come to that something else, Let's talk about the fault plane here. And the fault plane may or may not come to the surface. Uh, uh, it just depends on the fault. Uh, so sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. I was the architect for the Landers Elementary School. Uh, fault, plane did, fault, fault plane did come to the surface there. It was about four tenths of a mile away from my school. And, uh, and the offset, depending on where you were uh, in that neighborhood, it was either 8 foot up to 12 foot. No, it was no, nothing less than nothing, nothing more. But 8 foot to 12 foot of actual horizontal offset so that this block moved 8 to 12 feet that way and this block uh, basically stayed still. So we got this separation in distance. And when this thing breaks, it creates earthquake waves. And we have two basic types of waves. We have the first basic type of wave is a body wave. And surface waves. The body waves actually travel through the, the solid structure of the Earth. The first wave, the wave that travels the fast, it, fastest, is sometimes called the primary wave, but it's really a compressional wave. My voice is a compressional wave. My voice is the vocal cords in here are rattling back and forth in my throat, are compressing the air molecules and rarefying the air molecules. And that's exactly what happens in an earthquake. And they travel very, 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 very fast. 
They travel, uh, uh, anybody in the military ever? Uh, in here? Do you have to deal with debt court when you're in the military? <coughs> uh, uh, debt court is what we set charges off with. And it travels on an order of magnitude of 20,000 feet per second. Uh, 20,000 feet per second, that's about uh, 8,000 miles an hour. Uh, that's pretty quick. Uh, that's like, like Mach 10 and a half. Uh, uh, it's very, very fast. These uh, compressional waves ten to twenty k feet per second. The next wave, and uh, uh, basically what happens is these waves radiate outward from this as a sphere. Now, it's not really a sphere because the Earth is kind of fun. And it's, this is a, not that nonlinear dynamic stuff that I was talking about. So it goes away a little faster in one direction, a little slower in another direction. But in general, between 10 and 20,000 feet per second. And uh, usually the shortest place that it can go is right straight up to the epicenter. That's the, the shortest uh, uh, distance that it can take. The next wave is a shear wave. And it travels about uh, five to 10,000 feet per second. So it's about half as fast uh, as the compressional waves. That travel time is key to earthquake early warning. Because if we have instruments set in places, we can detect the difference in travel time. And every geology student, I, I did my geology degree back in the late 60s and early 70s, and every geology student would, uh, would ask their geophysics professor, can't we use this? And uh, at the time, no, we couldn't. Uh, just to, we didn't have enough knowledge of how to do it. But that time uh, was rapidly, rapidly coming. The military wanted to know those times. Uh, scorpions use those times. Uh, 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 scorpions have little sensors in their feet that when they walk around, they can tell when a beetle is coming toward them, going away from them, going lateral to them. And scorpions hunt at night, and they don't have really good eyes at night, uh, but their feet tell them where their prey is. And because their feet uh, are on the ground at different places, they can actually use that time difference, and this we've known since the 1970s, uh, that scorpions were able to actually hunt their prey based on these wave arrivals. Because every time a bug takes a step, it's creating a little tiny, tiny, tiny earthquake. Now, uh, you can imagine a little beetle walking on the dirt out there, not creating a big earthquake, but it's enough that the scorpion can figure out where that bug is and go sting it and eat it. Uh, and that's how they, that's how they hunt. The next waves are the surface waves. And we have two different types of surface waves. And the surface waves, now, oh, by the way, the shear waves are waves that do this. So it would be like if I tied a rope to the wall over there and just stood here and shook that rope up and down, I'd get a sign going in, the, uh, in this. And that's what's going on down here in the body of the Earth. So these are body waves that are traveling inside the Earth. And I'm going to draw another little sphere coming down. The red sphere is going faster. The green sphere is going a little bit slower. And the next wave, these surface waves, let's change colors again. I have a blue. I have a blue here, too. Let's try that, if, unless it runs out. Uh, these waves are kind of like pebbles in a pond. All, when we're little kids, throw a pebble in the pond, you see the waves radiate outward. Well, it's like somebody standing at the bottom of the pond and throwing the pebble out of the pond, uh, instead of throwing the pebble into the pond. And the waves are radiating outward. It's very, very complex because of uh, uh, a bunch of things going on with exposed rocks and different soils and the tilt of rocks and things like that. And, waves bouncing off of things and coming coming back. It's 
extremely complex, but in general, we can think of it fairly simply as these waves just radiating outward, uh, kind of in circles, concentric circles. Uh, uh, and uh, there's two types of those waves, and you probably, how many of you have been in an earthquake and been outside when you're, when you're in an earthquake? Anybody been outside? And have you actually seen the ground shake? You can see the ground move. Well, this is what's exactly going on. And uh, we have two different types. One, we have a love wave. And this travels about 2,500. 2,500 feet per second down a Rayleigh wave. I'm never sure of the spelling. <clears throat> and this travels about 1,500 feet per second. And these are just round numbers. Uh, but notice the difference going on here, almost an order of magnitude uh, between this. So there's a big, big difference in here. Which waves do the damage to our buildings? That's what, uh, that's what the USGS will tell you, is it's the shear waves. Uh, because these really are shear waves. And, uh, but these are the things that we really call the shear waves. So if we use our vocabulary correctly, we don't refer to these as shear waves, we refer to these as the surface waves. Uh, because they're traveling along the surface of the Earth. And these are the waves that actually do the damage to our building. Uh, these waves are made up of this. So if these waves can't be really generated until this shear wave gets here and converts its direction. And so it goes from hitting the ground straight up to moving along the surface of the of the earth. Can we ask questions as you Absolutely. Know? Don't ask me hard questions. <laughs> Here, I mean, you're talking about the speed of these waves, but what about the force? I mean, so actually, what I just assume from what you're telling us, uh, the force of these waves, the log waves, I mean, would be less than the force of those uh, shear waves. Is that true or no? No. Uh, the, uh, the energy carried by these, these long waves is actually pretty big. Now, because it has to move the ground much more than the shear waves. The noise waves, now, they move the ground. Now, now, and you've all, if you've been in an earthquake, people say it sounds like a freight train coming before the earthquake <coughs> happens, uh, or it sounds like a truck coming, uh, and then there's a thump. Uh, now, well, that's the two arrivals, uh, the compressional wave and the uh, shear wave. The train coming sound, it, to noise uh, is the uh, uh, is the uh, compressional wave, and the thump that you hear is the shear wave. Uh, and the shear waves, remember, they're going up and they're going out. So they're creating, and this is some of the complexity here. They're creating new shear waves over here. They're doing funnier, 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 and funnier things to the uh, uh, to the Rayleigh waves. But the, they don't move the ground very much, and we're going to look at that in just a second. Uh, they move the ground a little bit, but not a lot. These are the bad guys that move the ground a whole bunch. And that brings us back to our vocabulary where we talked about magnitude. You're all architects. Uh, what magnitude do you design your buildings to? And this is a trick question, by the way. I'll tell you that. 7.2? 7.4? 5? 5, but... Uh, OSHA requested for the uh, hospital seven. Zero. We don't design anything to a magnitude. We can't. No. There is no connection uh, between magnitude and design. We <coughs> design to ground acceleration, ground velocity, and displacement for ground. Back to your question. This is the surface wave going up and down. And by integrating displacement over time, we can get the velocity. By integrating the second time, we can get the acceleration of what's going on. And acceleration, we characterize as a percentage of gravity. Uh, and a quick little diagram 
here to show you why we can't design to a magnitude 8 earthquake right here. And I'm going to put a magnitude 6 earthquake right here in Los Angeles. And this magnitude 8 earthquake, how far is it from Los Angeles to San Francisco? <coughs> yeah, 350 miles plus or minus. Uh, uh, and this is, remember, a magnitude 8. And this is magnitude 6. We're, we're talking about Richter 6. Yeah, right? Yes, talking about magnitude. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and actually, we're talking about moment magnitudes because we never talk about Richter magnitude. The newspapers still talk about Richter magnitude. But in uh, no, earthquake engineering, we talk about uh, moment magnitude, which is a different thing. Moment kind of rules the universe. Um, uh, which one of these earthquakes will do more damage what? to LA? LA. Magnitude 6. Magnitude 6. It's closer. It's closer. And that's, even though this fault that goes, I'll bring this in the this fault San Andreas Fault, uh, and basically uh, so they're associated with San Andreas Fault uh, in both places at the same relative depth. The fall off of the surface waves that do the damage is the old inverse square law. Uh, if, uh, uh, the inverse square law, my voice, uh, you can hear me in here. If you open the door, you might be able to barely hear me across the street. Uh, uh, get too far away and it attenuates itself. And that's, like I said, just the inverse square law. Well, it's the same thing with light, inverse, inverse square law. But down here, we're real close to it. Uh, so we don't design to magnitude because we don't know, one, what the magnitude is going to be. Uh, we don't know where any given magnitude is going to be. So there's a black art in seismology, seismological engineering of considering all earthquakes that could possibly happen at our site and what would be the shaking that we should design to. And that's where the code, the SCP-7 that we use out of the code, because the earthquake stuff's no longer in the code. Now, you've got to have the ASCE 7 book to be able to do this. Now, the code tells us we have to design to some percentage of gravity here at our site. The, and, for instance, if we had a magnitude of eight earthquake here, which might be greater, actually, you know, quite a bit greater, greater intensity of, of shaking. Uh, now, the intensity of shaking has to take into account the duration of shaking, because it's not just how much it goes up and down, it's how long it goes. For instance, the uh, Mexico City earthquake in 1985, earthquake hypocenter, epicenter, was almost 200 miles away from Mexico City. Mexico City shook for seven minutes in some place because the ground is so bad. Seven full minutes it shook. Northridge, our magnitude 6.7 earthquake that happened in Northridge, we had strong shaking, eight to 12 seconds. Uh, in some places, uh, Pacoima Dam, places like that, they had 20 seconds worth of strong shaking, but not a, uh, not a long period of uh, shaking. And uh, uh, so we don't design to magnitude. We design to intensity of shaking. Intensity scale, when I was a young geology student, was just a uh, subjective scale. Uh, does it rattle the dishes in your kitchen? Does it knock books off the shelves? Does it knock your chimneys down? Uh, those, that set the various intensities. But uh, starting in the 70s, uh, the mid-70s, they started being able to tie percentage of gravity to all that, because they got more data. And, uh, so that, that let, them, uh, let them know about that. Uh, these, uh, uh, these earthquake waves, 
are basically what are creating the intensity, and mainly these. So out of this, we get a noise, which very low intensity. Out of this, we get a thumb, which may throw a book off the shelf. But out of these, we run the risk of having lots of non-structural damage. Uh, we don't design our buildings in the United States to fall down. Uh, we design our buildings to sustain a certain amount of damage, and as long as the people can get out of the building after the earthquake, that's a good thing. The uh, speed of the fault rupture in here, if we figure, uh, 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 for instance, did you all hear about the great shakeout uh, that the USGS has every year? Uh, they just had it uh, a few months ago, uh, where they postulate an earthquake that will rupture from Bombay Beach down here up to Fort Tejon about here, which is about 200 miles. And the USGS says that that rupture will actually take, uh, if it starts down here and ruptures up, or if it starts up here and ruptures down, or if it starts in the middle and ruptures in both directions, it'll actually take uh, roughly two minutes to, to happen. And you can run the mathematics on that uh, and figure out that uh, assuming 10,000 feet per second, that that rupture along the whole fault is actually going about 6,000 miles an hour. And yes? Um, when you say magnitude 8 or 6, uh, does it measure at the surface or at the epicenter? Well, the epicenter is at the surface, but we can never have a seismograph at the focus or the hypocenter because they're too deep. No, we just can't. And we never know where they're actually going to, going to be. Uh, we know where there are a lot of faults, but we don't know which fault it's actually going to, going to rupture on. Uh, so we, can, we have to take the uh, seismographs, and we usually bury them in the, uh, in the earth. It's, the surface of the earth is just too sloppy. Uh, so they're better to be buried at some depth in the earth. But it doesn't have to be very deep. But we put them on a uh, rigid mass as a general rule. Uh, so we'll pour a little concrete in the bottom of the hole or something like that to actually set them on. Uh, when we just want to get some field measurements, we can take some seismographs out to the field and measure them in the field that way, right, literally right smack dab on the, on the spot there. We take a hole back in uh, at that point in time. So by measuring at the surface, the assume where the epicenter is? Yes, That's and basically what you do from that, you can't get it from just one station, you need at least three stations. And it's based on a great circle of the Earth because of all these travel times. Uh, they've known about this for a long, long time. Uh, uh, and the travel times will, will give you uh, a great circle on the Earth, and then if you have another uh, uh, recording station in another place, you get another great circle on the Earth, and that tells you there's two places that that earthquake could have happened. But then if you have a third one, uh, there's another great circle, and that will only intersect at one point. But it's not perfect, so it doesn't really intersect at one point. It kind of intersects at a triangle. And the more recording stations that you have, and this is why if you get these preliminary earthquakes, it says it's, say, 6.7. The next day they say, oh, no, it's 6.9. Then the next day they say, oh, no, it's 6.6. Uh, it's because they keep adding stations, uh, get, they're getting reports from stations, and they're making everything uh, uh, more and more and more defined. And literally today, you can go to the literature today, and people are still writing papers about what was the actual magnitude of the North Ridge earthquake. That was 20 years ago. And uh, they're still writing papers and changing it just a little bit. And so magnitude is not useful to us as designers. It's useful to geophysicists. It's useful to seismologists. We want to know how much is the ground shaking beneath our building. That's what we want to know. Uh, uh, because there, we can get the force on the building out of the so amount of shaking. So we applied forces you know, that used by structural engineers, let's say in California zone four of earthquake, we don't have zones. Well, how, how is it based on? Yeah. What is it based on? There's no okay, when it was zone four, it was based on. Just say that, that looks good. Vehicle. Yeah, that looks good uh, because there was not much data. Now it's based on uh, a lot of data that's been recorded by the USGS. It's been very, very good data, uh, 
And it's getting better and better as we have earthquakes, not more and more and more earthquakes, getting much, much better. Uh, uh, but we still have a lot to learn, uh, a whole, a whole bunch to, to learn. So uh, we've kind of gotten through all of these basic stuff now. Now I can talk about the actual early warning system. Uh, I didn't lie a little bit here because I still need to talk about some of the basics of early warning. And the basics of early warning is that you've all seen in newspapers pictures of seismographic records, and they're never as clean as what I'm going to draw here. This is time that uh, comes across here. Time is going from some start point in time to some end point in time. And an earthquake record just kind of bounces along just with the noise, the daily noise of the earth, uh, trucks driving by this, uh, where the recording station is, things like that. And all of a sudden there will be a blip on, uh, uh, on the seismographic record. And this is the P wave arrival, which is this compressional wave up here. And let's do this in P, and this is an S, and, this is, and we'll lump these together as an F. So primary, secondary, long wave that goes along the surface. Uh, and then it quietens down. And uh, then a little bit later on, there's a bigger blip on it. And it also quietens down after a while. And then all of a sudden, this is the surface wave that occurs here. So we have sure waves here and the long waves here. And we're not interested in what this <coughs> acceleration is. We're interested in two-thirds of that peak acceleration because statistically, that's what knocks our buildings, our, our, gives our buildings problems. So we'll figure out what two-thirds of, of this height actually is. To pick the magnitude, we're interested in this. Uh, the peak is what, what defines the magnitude. And uh, kind of a myth about magnitudes is that for uh, every jump in magnitude, it's, uh, uh, the earthquake is 10 times as strong. No, it's 10 times as large uh, on the excursion of the, of the needle. It's not 10 times as large. It's 31 and a half times as large. So I get the question all the time, well, don't we mitigate earthquakes by having a whole bunch of magnitude six earthquakes uh, as opposed to uh, one magnitude eight earthquakes. Since it's 31 and a half times to go from magnitude six to magnitude seven, 31 and a half times to go from magnitude six to magnitude eight is 31 and a half squared, and that's 1,000 times, which means we would have to have 1,000 magnitude six earthquakes in the same location to alleviate the stress and strain of a magnitude eight earthquake, and we don't have that. And if you go from magnitude 3 to you know, magnitude 8, it's a staggering number. You can't figure out how big that number actually is. You know, just can't imagine all the zeros in that number. Uh, and this time difference in here is what the early warning system is all about. We want to know uh, how much it's going to take, say our building is out here, we got a building out here. We want to know uh, when the P waves <coughs> strike our building out here, how much time do we have before the earthquake actually begins a strong motion on our building? And it only takes one second for us to uh, have something that we can do with that. Uh, and I'd like to ask you a question. What would you consider to be successful early warning? What, what would make success an early warning? Ten minutes. Five, five to ten okay, minutes. We're not going to get ten minutes. <laughs> five to ten seconds. Say again? Five to ten seconds. A couple of days. A couple of days. Now that's prediction. <laughs> we don't have a prediction. <laughs> One minute? No. Uh, in some cases, we can have one minute, and uh, not likely to get ten minutes in many cases, although Mexico City 
has 10 minutes when, it, when the earthquake is 200 miles away. Uh, uh, they can get it. They can get a long, long uh, time. Uh, typically, if we can have one second, what is successful early warning is when we can get a signal in enough time to create some kind of response from people. Now, how many of you watch the news and you see the security cameras? These things are absolutely beautiful. Uh, you see these security cameras, people are in a 7-Eleven, and all of a sudden the thing is shaking and stuff is flying off of the shelf, and what are the people doing? Run. Say again? They're watching. They're mesmerized. What's going on? Uh, and that's the wrong thing to do. Uh, <laughs> you should be dropping, covering, and holding on. And the hold on is because if you get underneath that table, that table's going to try and go somewhere that you're not. So you want to hold on to that table, and if it's going to move, and it's got enough mass, it'll just drag you with it. Uh, why? Not because our buildings fall down, because we have very good coats, and we have, quite frankly, a good record as long as we don't have conduct or reinforced concrete or unreinforced masonry. Uh, but architecturally, we have buildings that do and perform very, very well in earthquakes. Uh, uh, but you get under something, and uh, stuff. say again. Stuff. Is it's the stuff. Yeah, it's the it's the stuff. That's what hurts people. And uh, there's a lot of you know this is a modern building, so this stuff is not likely to fall. The ceiling tiles might fall, but they only weigh one two pounds. Uh, these weigh one pound. The four foot ones weigh two pounds. Uh, they just don't weigh very much. They won't hurt you, uh, but they might cause panic. Uh, and uh, uh, but if you have a successful warning, and a successful warning can be second and a half, uh, where it can because this actually all happens at this almost the speed of light, not quite the speed of light, but almost the speed of light, where the computer uh, and there's a whole bunch of arrays out here between us and the building that says we're going to have an earthquake and it does the algorithms to go through it and says issue a warning. And there are a lot of different kinds of warnings that, you, that can be issued. Uh, but uh, the biggest thing is drop, cover, and hold now. Uh, people take direction, but if you leave them to their own devices, they'll stand there and watch. Uh, and that's the wrong thing to, wrong thing to do. The second wrong, second one, second one. <laughs> should know how to count. Uh, the second wrong thing to do is to get up and try and run out of the building because our buildings shed stuff on the outside. Uh, just like they will shed stuff in here, they will shed stuff on the outside. And the best thing to do, uh, you get under something. If you're in the Army, people shooting at you, you learn how to hide behind a blade of grass, literally. Uh, and uh, tables are very good. If you can't fit under the chair, get your head and neck and upper back underneath the, underneath the chair. So you get hit in the rear end, not that big of a deal, but your your neck is very, very vulnerable to impacts. Uh, and so get your head under the under the chair. Share the chair if you have to. Don't fight somebody over the chair. <laughs> oh, go under the chair. Now, what else can we do? We're architects. What do you think uh, uh, you can do, say, if you are designing a fire station? Uh, what could early warning do for you in a fire station? Sound alarms. Mm -hmm. Sound alarms, yes. Get the trucks out. Say again? Get the trucks out. Well, you're not going to have enough time to get the yeah. trucks out, but there's a preamble to getting the trucks out. And what would that preamble be? The doors open. Get the doors open. And the early warning system can just simply flip the switch. Somebody didn't have to walk over and flip the switch. The early warning system can flip the switch and at least start the doors up. Uh, if you're very close to the epicenter, and I'll talk about this in a little while, uh, if you're very close to the epicenter, that's where you have the, you know, the very short durations of uh, time, one or two seconds. If you're a few miles away from it, uh, then you're starting to get into the 3, 4, 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds worth of early warning, and that's enough to actually do a lot of things. In a hospital, what can you, what can you do? What are the things? Anybody design hospitals? I saw transformer. Some Say again? Turn on the transformer. Yeah, you can you can take care of some of the electrical Generator. issues. The, the, now, you need minutes to get an emergency power supply up to speed and running and be able to run the transfer. Uh, but you can at least get it started. 
and uh, get the machine to you know start up and cough and spew smoke, uh, uh, but at least get running. The other thing you can do is there are people on machines in a hospital that if the line power goes down, that can actually be turned on almost instantly. So there's no coming up to speed. It's just, it disconnects the line power before it goes down, and, and actually when they go down, you know, they give quite a few times a big power uh, burst into the, into the system, and that's why you see sparks fly and things, things like that. And it just disconnects and goes right straight to UPS. Same with communication centers, data centers, banking, uh, transmission lines. Uh, you know that's our, about our biggest vulnerability in the entire United States is, is our power grid. If you sever certain links in the grid, you can black out the entire country. Uh, and uh, in 19, I think it was 96 or 97, there was a fire underneath the Bonneville uh, power line, a single line. Uh, it had a wildfire underneath it, burned the lines, and the entire west coast went black. Uh, and we were black for a few hours. Uh, uh, one single line caused the entire west coast to, uh, to go out. Now, if a fault breaks, you may break a whole bunch of infrastructure. Is it better for these uh, uh, power lines to be underground or not? Well, the big the big lines typically are not underground just because of the cost. And uh, in the cities, we have uh, we don't get the big million volt transmission lines underground very often. Uh, there's nothing to prevent them from being put underground except how much it costs to, to put them underground. Well, it's much cheaper to string them across the open. They can see them, they can test them, they can perform maintenance on them much, much easier. But that does make them vulnerable to all kinds of natural disasters. Uh, big hailstorms, ice storms, uh, uh, all kinds of things. It's not just earthquakes uh, that, they're, that they're vulnerable to. Lots and lots of things. Then it's better we take it like that, or it's better they spend money and put it on the ground? I'm not involved in that loop, so oh. I really don't have an answer for that. Uh, uh, I can't even get into to spend a, a tiny amount of money for the earthquake early warning system. And, uh, 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 so, I don't know. Uh, that's not a, not a question I can answer. I apologize. Gas shut off loud. Say again? Gas shut off loud. Yeah, yeah, you can, shut off, you can shut off the gas. There are all kinds of things that you can do automatically. But the big thing is getting all your people to drop, cover, and hold in schools. You know, we train kids to, to do this, but there have been cameras in classrooms that uh, the earthquake comes, uh, primary and secondary wave uh, have already come and gone, strong shaking starts, and that's when everybody notices there's the earthquake, and everybody stands up and says, what's going on? You know, and uh, uh, kids need to be under underneath the desks uh, instantly. And, and again, we take direction very well. And all of our machinery can take direction very well. And that brings us back to what successful warning is. A successful warning is when you get something that needs to be done, done uh, ahead of time, rather than standing there and being mesmerized by it. And there's no end to the things that we can actually do with this. We are only limited by our imagination as to what we can actually automate. Japan has this system already. Right? Yes, that is going to bring us to this, this, and this. Exactly that. Uh, uh, not only Japan has an early warning system, uh, uh, but China does, and Romania does, what? and Turkey does. Uh, and Romania and uh, Turkey, they're limited uh, uh, to just one have, area. But we don't have it. No. <laughs> uh, uh, Mexico does. Uh, Mexico was the first one to put in a regional earthquake early warning system, and they did it as a result of the 1985 Mexico City earthquake. It really wasn't a Mexico City earthquake, it was an Acapulco earthquake, uh, because that's where it actually happened. It's just all the damage was in Mexico City, uh, because 
the ground was jello. And uh, they did it in 1991 and 1992. Now, is it perfect? <coughs> no, it's not perfect. Uh, it has some problems. Uh, and uh, one of the problems is they released the uh, signals to uh, people with uh, that write apps for your phone. And, uh, and they release the signals without any filtering. So they just had a, what I would call a failure. Uh, about a year ago, they had a fairly small earthquake off of Acapulco, and it notified everybody in Mexico City and all the hospitals did all their shutdown on the fire station, put their doors up and this and that and the other, and then nothing happened uh, because it wasn't a very big earthquake. <coughs> And in reality, we should not have false positives you know, because people will become uh, jaded to false positives. How many of you pay attention to your Amber Alerts when you get them on the phone? Yeah, nobody. And that's what you don't want. You don't want people to become jaded to it. You want them to understand that when they get an alarm, that the alarm gives them direction and tells them what to do. So uh, Japan's uh, actually works quite well. Uh, Mexico's works well sometimes and doesn't work well other times. Uh, Italy has one. Uh, uh, so quite a few places have one. Now, what do we have here in the United States? Uh, we have had this off-the-shelf technology uh, since the mid-1990s. Uh, I was on the Seismic Safety Commission in the mid-1990s, and that's when we, we got the uh, technology from Lawrence Livermore, and it was military technology, and it was a technology transfer uh, uh, thing. And then we kind of went out shopping for who could do this, and we found a company that said they could do this, and they did. They built, uh, they started out just building a box that would work in a room. Uh, uh, and uh, that, they had that box up and running by the early 2000s. And it was about that big and didn't cost very much. It cost a few thousand dollars uh, for that box. Now it's peanuts. Uh, uh, but a, a, a box for a room is not what we want. We want something bigger and better. Uh, so then their next step was, well, let's take care of a whole school. Uh, let's take care of uh, uh, fire stations, and let's interlink fire stations so we only have to have one or two fire stations in a city that are on these boxes. And they did that. Uh, and Napa, uh, and that's what Given said today, was uh, we had this great success in the last Napa earthquake. Uh, we tested our data system. And question? Just now. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Just checking. Okay. <laughs> Seeing if I'm watching. Okay. <laughs> uh, we uh, had this great success with uh, the Napa earthquake on our beta system. Well, beta system is a system that's still in testing. And here, Napa actually had in place private enterprise uh, systems in the fire stations, all the fire stations up there. And uh, they, by the way, I'm going to get to this blind zone thing down here that the USGS insists uh, uh, we can't solve. Uh, and yet, uh, they took care of all the fire stations that were in the USGS defined blind zone. Uh, and uh, 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 so we have some systems. We, right now, the same company has gotten together with uh, all of the Coachella Valley and Imperial Valley. And uh, they went together with all the hospitals down there, all the sheriff stations, all the local police stations, all the schools, all the hospitals, all the communications centers. And uh, they put in sensors and connected them all. And the US government <coughs> promised them uh, enough funding to now turn this system on. And then the USGS said, oh, no, 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 that's not invented here. We can't have that system going in and running down there under private enterprise because we are the USGS and only we in California can issue alerts. Well, that's not exactly right. 
uh, the governor, uh, two years ago, signed a bill that said there will be a public-private partnership for earthquake early warning. Uh, and uh, that public-private partnership will include the USGS and the California Division of uh, Geology. And it changes names every 10 years. It used to be California Division of Mines and Geology. California Division of Geology this week. Uh, and private enterprise. Uh, and the first test area, uh, or the first operational one, was meant to be the Coachella Valley system. And you can look it up uh, it's, uh, on, the, on the internet. It's called CRUS and ICRUS, uh, uh, C R E W S and I C R E W S. The I stands for the Imperial to kind of separate them out. But all one regional system on the southern leg of the San Andreas Fault that has a fairly high potential <coughs> of rupture because there's a lot stress on that leg of the fault right now. Uh, and there's been a lot of stress on that leg of the fault for about 300 years. Uh, and that fault has the historic, for what they've been able to tell, uh, over the last uh, uh, few thousand years, six to eight thousand years, a rupture interval of about 125 to 150 years. And it's been 300 years. Uh, so it's apparently overdue. Uh, overview fairly significantly. And USGS went to Congress and said, no, 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 no. Don't give them the money for that. They need to give us our, our money. And what's the analogy for this? Now, anybody know when the first internal combustion engine car was built? Anybody have any idea? 1900? Yeah, I, I thought it was 1885. Yeah. Uh, but I actually looked it up today to be sure. And boy, was I wrong. There was a hydrogen-powered internal combustion engine in 1807. Wow. Yeah, 1807, run on hydrogen. It was the step we're talking about running cars on in the future. And it was already running on hydrogen in 1807. The guy never went into production. He built one. Ben's built uh, uh, several for customers in 1885. Uh, so he is considered to be the first production automobile. And uh, if I want to go buy a car, how many car dealers are in this town? A whole bunch. And I can go to any one of those car dealers and buy a car. What's the USGS want to do if they want to buy a car? They want to go back to 1807, critique what was done back in 1807, and then design a whole new system instead of what was already available. Uh, and they're 200 years behind. Not 200 years behind in the seismic stuff, they're 20 years behind in the seismic stuff. And that is criminal, absolutely criminal. They should be partners with the state of California, they should be partners with the state of Oklahoma, they should be partners with private enterprise, uh, and they shouldn't be competing with private, uh, private enterprise for what can be done because the government has a fiduciary responsibility not to compete with you. That's why there are no state architects that design schools, uh, uh, because that would take work away from you and me. Uh, that's why there are no state architects that design hospitals. Now, they have to find some things, like Caltrans uh, gets to do their own freeways, but they don't really do much of those anymore. They have a lot of employees, but they don't actually design most of their freeways. They do kind of the specs than uh, private industry that actually does the design. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason we don't have it here is strictly a turf ball. And that's <coughs> a mistake. Absolute mistake. So where does this leave architects? Uh, no. When you design a facility that can benefit from earthquake early warning, uh, there is off-the-shelf technology that's very inexpensive. Uh, cost per square foot for sprinkler systems, depending on the facility, what, five to 15 bucks a square foot now, depending on the, uh, the sprinkler system that you, that you put in. A standalone uh, box for a facility that can actually do things is about 30 grand uh, to, put in, to put into a building. And, uh, and it's just literally <coughs> plug the wires in and what do you want it to do? Become pre-programmed uh, with 
what you wanted to do. Do you want it to open your fire firehouse doors uh, when strong motion starts? Do you want it to issue an audible? By the way, it can do a whole bunch of things. It can't do, they just don't have to do one thing. They can issue the audible alarms, they can turn the water off, they can turn the power on, they can open the, they can start the doors to, to open up. All kinds of things can be run out of a single little box for 30 grand. Uh, uh, less than what we put in now for our sprinklers. And uh, fire's probably more likely than earthquakes, uh, but earthquakes are more widespread and probably a little more deadly uh, than fires do with non-structural stuff, especially in, especially in older buildings. So I would encourage you, uh, when you uh, do a project that could benefit from early warning, because we're in this weird spot, uh, I would encourage you uh, all to talk to your clients uh, about uh, uh, installing uh, an earthquake early warning system and tell them the benefits. You know, your people might not get injured, and uh, you're going to have less liability as a client from injured people from systems falling. You as architects are going to have less liability from people, from things that fall down that you may or may not have any control over. All the furniture that, you know, all the chairs on carts like that that get brought in. You have no control over that, but some lawyer would sue you if that fell on somebody. You're sitting next to it, yeah. you get squished. <laughs> <laughs> I think it needs to be a private, a public-private partnership. I don't think it needs to just be private. Uh, I think there's a role for government. doing it as a public, you're just asking us I would to say start it. then start, start it. As absolutely, private. absolutely start it. So the device is available, right? They're off the uh, shelf, and they've been off the shelf for 20 years. And do we need a special, I mean, uh, trade, I mean, to do this? No, so sir. It's uh, to uh, uh, specify this. I mean, how do uh, yeah. we get involved as architects in you know, convincing the clients? What, the developers what you would have a sales job to do would be with your authority having jurisdiction because they're not going to know about it either. So uh, we educate our clients all the time. We educate uh, AHJs all the time. We educate contractors all the time. Uh, sometimes we need to educate our engineers. Uh, and, uh, you know, they can, you know, you can just point them in the right direction. They can go kind of sort it out themselves. It's basically uh, no different than installing a computer. Uh, it, it's basically just a little computer, <coughs> and it needs power. Uh, uh, and it really doesn't care once the earthquake starts uh, if power goes out or not, because it's already given its warning. It's, uh, it's done what it needs to do. But they all have backup batteries. And the reason they have backup batteries is in case the power is out when the earthquake happens, they'll still work. And you don't want them to not work just because the power is out. That was basically the committee that I was sitting on for the state last year uh, in developing the protocols uh, of, you know, how much battery time do you, do you need to have these things continue to, to operate if the power happens to go out. What kind of a signal can it put out? Can it just put out an audible signal? Well, no. You put out all kinds of signals. How are we going to do it? Cell phones, I think, is a long way away uh, uh, just because of the overload system. That's what happened in Mexico. Because there was a total overload. In fact, their, uh, their cell phones went down uh, eventually because of it. Uh, uh, but everybody has to get educated on it. Uh, and it's no different than when architects first found out about fire sprinklers. Uh, uh, and uh, a big education is going to come with insurance companies. Uh, if you, you know, if you drive the money, uh, and insurance companies are kind of a big money driver in facilities. Uh, uh, if they see a benefit for it, they'll be recommending it to their uh, insured. It'll be like, uh, do you have uh, unreinforced masonry on your house when you buy your house insurance? Uh, you check that box, and your premium's a big premium. Uh, do you smoke? You check that box, uh, your premium is going to be a little bit higher. Uh, uh, and it's going to be a new box. Uh, do you have an earthquake early warning system? The premium goes down. It's an installed warning system. Eventually they will learn. They don't know it yet. But eventually, eventually they will learn. Yes, ma'am. 
can states uh, act on their own without yes. USGS's uh, yes, approval? They can. Yes, they can. Uh, in California, uh, it just seemed to be the wise thing, both uh, 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 from everybody's perspective, at that time, including mine, mm -hmm. that uh, it was best to have kind of this triad. A dozen of them were in the what the USGS defined as the blind zone, and they were able to all open the door or get the door started. Up. You can't open the door in a second, and a half, but you can get the door started. Up. Uh, and uh, uh, that's kind of the, that's kind of the big deal. Just getting it actually started. Otherwise, if it doesn't start. Uh, then before they can drive their trucks out, they have to get their saw out. They all have these big saws that cut a hole in the door, push the door down, then drive it. Uh, and that's just waste of time uh, that, they, that the fire trucks could be out doing what they need to do. Because it takes them about 10 minutes to do that. And there's no reason for them to sit in a fire station for 10 minutes that they, that they don't have to. When was this? Uh, uh, the, Napa, yeah. the Napa earthquake just a few months ago. Yeah, it was last year. Oh, yeah, yeah, 2000. I don't recall exactly. Not that long. Fairly, fairly recent. Considering the uh, time needed to react for an average person, uh, don't you think that the one and a half, even one and a half second is actually basically nothing? Uh, because it would any, seem like it. It would seem like any, it. Any uh, event like that, the first. Uh, the thing that happens is when an average person goes in the state of shock until he can put, put himself or herself together and then start thinking, and that would take more than even, I guess, five seconds? No, no, it would seem like it, but it doesn't. Uh, when people are left to their own devices and are not given direction, it takes a long time. But when you tell people to do something, they have the first responses. I bet do this. No, and it, it's just a secondary nature. And there, no, there are sociologists that also thought, hmm, that can't possibly be. So they ran tests. And these were blind tests where they weren't telling people what they were doing. They were just going to give them direction to do something. And sometimes it was benign things like, pick up the red pencil. Like, There's a red pencil. You know, like 80% of the people. Is everybody going to do it? No. But the majority of people take... Uh, uh, kind of, I, I don't want to say forceful, but authoritative kind of direction fairly, fairly well. Uh, uh, those of you that were in the military, uh, when somebody said, get down, uh, you didn't stop and think, I wonder why the sergeant's telling me to get down. <laughs> you just got down, because if you didn't, you might be dead. Uh, now, does it take training? Is training a good thing? Yes, sociologists have also determined that training people is very good. We train our K-12 students very, very well, but we forget very, very fast. My first day of teaching, uh, I walked in, uh, teaching earthquake engineering, I walked into the class and I told the students, I am your seismic safety commissioner, and I ordered an earthquake for 1010. <laughs> and I'll be old, damn, we didn't have an earthquake at 1010. And and yet here were students, and I had nothing to do with this. I mean, I just I just pulled a number out of the air, and it actually actually happened, uh, uh, which is total coincidence. I'm not clear. Uh, and but what happened was when the earthquake started, I I you know didn't tell people to get down. I got underneath the podium. There's a little podium up here that I can, you know, three-sided. And I got inside that, and I didn't hear anybody do anything. I poked my head out. And here's all these college students that had had 12 years of drop, cover, and hold, and not one of them was under their desk. And so then I yelled at them, and I used a couple of words. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then they did. Uh, but uh, fortunately, it was a smaller point. It was down in Chino, which is fairly close to the campus. So even though it was a very small earthquake, we actually felt it shaking pretty, pretty good. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, for me, it happened to have been second nature. I'm going down. Uh, 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 and we need to constantly train and think about it. Uh, uh, you know, athletes don't once they get their contract, they don't stop training. 
train their entire career. We always need to train for the things that we need to, need to know. I know. I drive racing cars. I don't just show up at a race and race. I'm constantly training for it, constantly. Either mentally or physically, it's called seat time. You know, you just go out and drive the car. You drive the car. You're not racing anybody, you're just driving the car. You get seat time for it. And that's called practice. And we need to practice all the time. Does earthquake follow gravity? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Like, for example, when you said um, epicenter, I mean, like it can happen, it goes up. And I, faster it goes up because there's a less distance than going down. And I was thinking, okay, if it, if it was going gravity, it would go faster down. Oh, no, it's not a, it's not a gravitational relationship because you're not dropping something. It's just a wave moving through the Earth. Now, it does go down. Uh, if you look at a cross-section of, uh, uh, of the Earth, uh, we've got kind of a thin onion skin around the outside of the Earth, and this is called the crust. And then we have uh, the mantle. And then we have the core. And if we have an earthquake over here, uh, most of the earthquakes occur in crust. If, uh, only a few earthquakes occur down the, the mantle. Uh, most of them actually occur in the brittle crust. And these waves now radiate outward, but they radiate all through the earth. With one exception, the outside of the core, is liquid. And we know it's liquid because these shear waves will not propagate through liquids. Uh, so we will, if we have a seismic station over here, we can record the compressional wave, the shear wave, and uh, the surface waves at that seismic station. Over here, because it has to go through the liquid part of the core, there's this shadow zone that uh, any stations around here will not record those shear waves because they can't go through the liquid part of the core. And it's complicated a little bit because there are also some hot spots that are liquid in the upper part of the upper part of the mantle also that create some uh, 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 some shadow zones. But uh, waves being waves, when they get over here, what do they do? They bounce back. And they go back in this direction. And so now, here we have a shadow zone for the bounce back. And the Earth just basically rings like a bell. Uh, it literally rings like a ding. It just keeps going and going and going. But there are places that we lose the shear waves because they can't go through the uh, But it really doesn't have anything to do with gravity uh, because that, we would actually have to drop something. Just the wave that's going not uh, going through something, but it kind of does gravity for our buildings because it creates this percentage of gravity that we design for. Uh, and the ambient building that we design for is about twenty percent of gravity <coughs> horizontal. Now, is there any expansion occurring in the core? Here? I don't know. I don't know about any expansion occurring in the, in the core. In the core. I don't know. I'm, I'm so going. actually, the movement of this, the horizontal movement of the layers of the Earth always happens, I mean, at the cross? At the well, whatever, we have, uh, in, the, uh, in the mantle? In the mantle, we have what are called convection cells. Uh, hot material rises, cold material falls. So we get these convection cells that are going around like this and hot material rising, cold material falls. And that's what drives the plates. Is It's like a conveyor belt. Uh, and it pushes the plates, and sometimes the plates bump into each other and they make mountains, like the Himalaya mountains. Sometimes the plates <coughs> ride underneath uh, others, they make subduction zones, like the Chilean Trench, or the Marianas Trench, the Challenger, Challenger Deep, or the Japanese Trench. 
and sometimes they rub past one another, as in Turkey, uh, along the northern coast of Turkey, or our San Andreas here. That's, this is a rub past one another, such that uh, it's going in that, that relative direction. So this ring of fire, is that a myth or actually it exists? No, it's, that it's, 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 it's where all the, the plates are. It's where, it's where all the plates are, all around basically the Pacific Basin. So why this is the most active part of the Earth? It's, no, uh, uh, it's because no, nothing is growing in the Earth. We're not adding any, there's no material added, except, you know, a few common dust and things like that that fall on us. But there's no material added to the Earth, so no, the Earth's not getting any bigger in diameter, no, and something, we can't no, destroy matter, no, we can only change <coughs> matter, we can't destroy energy, we can only change energy. And so when this thing moves, either it has to do that, it has to do that, or it has to do that. And but my question is, why is it this most, I mean, um, the majority of this activity around the ring of fire? Oh, because that's the, biggest, that's the biggest part of the Earth, but it's also in different, it's in other parts of the world also. It's just, no, that's kind of the most obvious, because the Pacific Ocean is huge. So statistically, we can see it the most. But it's occurring in India, it's occurring in Africa, it's occurring in the mid-Atlantic. No, it's, no, it's occurring all around the world. No, it just so happens the Pacific happens to have this big ring of fire. Now, that wasn't always there, and it won't always be there. No, no, 200 million years ago, it wasn't there. No, 200 million years from now, it probably won't be there. It, no, it won't come and go. Plate tectonics, which is what all of that stuff is called, has been going on for a little over two billion years, almost two and a half billion years. Been going on. And by the way, they think they found plate tectonics on Pluto. And they think they found plate tectonics now on Mars. Uh, when I grew up in geology, they thought Mars and Pluto were both totally dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they've, uh, with re-examination, they think they've actually found some evidence of real plate tectonics. Now you said the, the Earthquake happens on the crust. Yes, most right. of the most earthquakes most occur on the crust. crust. The focus in hypercenter. Some estimate about what what is the depth of this crust? Oh, good question. Now it depends on where you are. In fact, when I was a little kid, the Russians wanted to drill a hole in the crust. It was called uh, uh, the Moho problem. We were going to participate in, in it also. It was a, a joint project, and they wanted to do it out in the ocean where it's at its thinnest. It's about three miles. Uh, and we have the technology to drill three miles into the into the crust, but it was a really bad idea uh, because there is a tremendous amount of pressure down here. This is why volcanoes work. There's so much pressure that when we get a conduit to the surface, uh, and it would have been a really really bad idea to drill a hole down into that. Not don't know what. And there's actually people today talking again about drilling another hole down there. So we go from the ocean crust that's on average about three miles to uh, the maximum depths of the crust at uh, the subduction zones where a piece of the crust goes uh, one, two, three, four hundred miles. The Challenger Deep actually goes about four hundred miles. Four hundred miles? Miles, but it's, it's yeah. just this piece of the crust that's mm -hmm. down there. It's not actually the thickness of, I the, I of the crust. Underneath the Himalaya Mountains, where they're bumping the, into each other, and they're not only doing this, but they're doing more of this. So you got the big mountains up here, and you also have big roots mm -hmm. down here. And in those places, it's probably about 50 about 50 miles from top to, top to bottom. So it, it, it depends on where you're, where you're at. That was the side question. The main question is that when it happens on the cross, generates waves, as you said, yes. they go down, down, down. And I assume that it dissipates as it goes. Yes, it's the, no, basically the inverse square law. So that's why nothing happens on the other on side. The side of the, except seismographs can feel. Seismographs are very, very sensitive, so they can feel the ringing of the bell. Uh, and in some cases, it doesn't quite work that nice and easy. For instance, in uh, 1811 and 1812, uh, uh, Lewis and Clark 
were out by the Mississippi River on their trek across the United States, you know, and there was a series of very large earthquakes in the New Madrid area. And it's called New Madrid today because Old Madrid is now in the middle of the Mississippi. The Mississippi changed course by about a quarter of a mile and swallowed the little, it was a little town, uh, swallowed the original Madrid, uh, Missouri. And so all the people that lived uh, built over on the shores of the Mississippi, <clears throat> now right off of where Old Madrid was. The it was such, those earthquakes are so strong that the Mississippi flowed northward for a full day. Mm. And it rang church bells in New York. Wow. Uh, now, why did it do that? That's uh, this mid-continent stuff is all this very flat, layered sediments that uh, uh, are fairly loose. We have a lot of rock out here in California, but they don't have much rock back here. They have a lot of sands and silts and clays, and that kind of wiggles. And that wiggly goes all the way <coughs> to the East Coast. Uh, the Rockies sort of is where all the rocks actually, the big rocks start. There's some rocks in, uh, in the East Coast, but, uh, but it was able to actually ring church bells in uh, New York. Now, what I was uh, uh, interested in, have you come across to any event that caused another one? Oh yeah, all the time. Uh, uh, or how far apart then? Well, we, you know, I just got educated on that a little bit uh, because uh, a year and a half ago, I would have said, well, if there's an earthquake over here, it's not going to do anything over here and make an earthquake. Well, you was just a, that wasn't exactly the right. Now, we, we think they now can trigger some earthquakes even at very great distance, like across the entire Pacific. They can, they can actually trigger some earthquakes. I don't know that they've ever actually found any evidence, but they've done it mathematically. They've been able to say mathematically it can, it can work. Uh, but we do know that earthquakes, now I mentioned I was the architect for the Landers Elementary School. There were two earthquakes that day. One was a Landers earthquake, and a couple hours later was a Big Bear earthquake. And that was an earthquake that was triggered by the Landers earthquake. Now, uh, if the San Andreas breaks, there are so many faults along the San Andreas that are little splays of it, mm -hmm. the San Jacinto, and the Newport Inglewood, and the Elsinore. Uh, we very, uh, Cucamonga uh, fault, we very well could be creating, you know, San Andreas goes, well, there could be sympathetic earthquakes on any of those other faults. It could be big earthquakes in their own right. They could be magnitude 7 earthquakes in their own right. Because uh, all of those faults are big enough to create magnitude 7 earthquakes. They're not big enough to create magnitude 8 earthquakes, but they're not create magnitude 7 earthquakes. And so we could, and Japan, uh, another example. Uh, originally, when Japan first happened, we thought it was a single magnitude 9 something earthquake. Uh, well, a year later, they figured out it was actually three separate earthquakes, two of them nine or greater, and one of them eight point one. Uh, three separate earthquakes within about ten minutes of each other. But they were completely separate earthquakes. They, usually they'll say, well, one is an aftershock of the other. No, no, these were... Yeah, when you say separate, that means that the, what... It was in a different place. It was a different place together. and a different fault kind of thing. Yeah. But with, all within ten minutes of each other. Uh, uh, probably... Uh, not unreasonable to assume that the 1811, uh, 1812 earthquakes in uh, Missouri were also uh, uh, created by each other. One happens, it puts stress on another fault. That one happens, it puts, you know, there's a series of three earthquakes. It then puts stress on another fault, and that creates an earthquake at a, at a little later time. Uh, uh, now, in Landers, it was a very low amount of time. In Missouri, it was it was a year worth of time that the earthquakes happened over. In uh, Japan, it was ten minutes. So, you know, I guess you have to figure out what is causing what what where you you know if you can say it does cause it and it doesn't cause it. I don't really know that. So they're in a close proximity of one another, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, Landers was ten miles away. Mm -hmm. uh, different fault. Uh, 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 clearly triggered. The USGS, you know, clearly says that was triggered uh, as a result of uh, 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 
the Landers earthquake. And the Landers earthquake actually had uh, uh, transfer of energy from uh, completely separate faults. So one piece of the Landers earthquake moved, and the energy moved across and uh, created an earthquake on the next fault. And then it did it a third time, uh, all the way out into Johnson Valley. And actually, where, uh, where it stepped from the first fault, uh, my Landers Elementary School was right free. We need to build that site for free. Mm -hmm. uh, or we need to build that site. And I said, no, 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 no. There's something really, really, really wrong with these rocks going out here. They were just busted to smithereens. And I finally got them to uh, agree to not take this free land and come over here and spend a lot of money. They spent like $3,000 to get the land mm -hmm. over here. <laughs> and so they were, that's all they were trying to save. So the school district hated me for about four years, about four years ago, the school actually built I uh, hated me until the earthquake happened. And then I was back in the good graces. <laughs> um, you cannot build on faults anymore, right? Say again? You cannot build on the faults anymore. It was not it was not on the fault. There was no fault there. Nobody uh, nobody had that everybody knew that there was the fault here because we had the Alcris Priolo Special Studies Zone. But there was nothing here that connected it. But by going out to the field and looking at the rocks, it was clear there was some connection there. Uh, but could I quantitatively say, I know there's a connection here? No, I couldn't say that. But every single one of the hairs, when I used to have hairs on my head and all the way down to here, uh, they were standing up on the back of my neck when I was when I was looking at this. And I just had to tell the superintendent, no, you can't build a school here. There was a house there. And uh, the people that were living in that house, we were, they were going to uh, uh, vacate the house for the school district. And the developer uh, that gave them the land was going to give them a new house. Uh, uh, so they also hated us. Uh, uh, but uh, they were asleep when the earthquake happened, happened at 6, 6 or 8 in the morning. I was digging dinosaur bones. I didn't find out for 10 days that the earthquake had actually happened. Uh, but uh, I went into the house, and you could see the imprint on the roof, or the ceiling, where their elbows and knees hit the ceiling. It was that much vertical acceleration, much, much greater than 1G. The house looked like somebody had put a 750-pound bomb into the, uh, underneath the house and just blew it up. Uh, there was a tree. In front of the in front of the house that was literally lifted out of the ground, <coughs> completely out of the ground, ripped the roots right out of the ground, and then the tree sat back down like this, uh, and uh, just unbelievable forces. Uh, it was really too bad there was no strong motion instruments right there. Speaking about forces, uh, I want to ask you something about this San Andreas fault. You know, there's a lot of little faults, yes. major faults, and there's a myth that one of one of these days a big one comes. That's not a myth. That's not a myth. That's it's not a myth. Okay. okay. That's not a myth. This part is myth that and completely separate. Uh, for example, Arizona becomes beachfront property. That's a myth. <laughs> That's a myth. That's a myth. Yeah. Now, I'm my question was, what? How much? What is the likelihood of something like this happening? Zero. Good. Absolutely impossible. Absolutely. There's not enough energy that the fault could store to dump that side. Of, you know, we don't live on the North American uh, plate. We live on the North American continent, mm -hmm. but we live on the East Pacific plate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and there's not enough energy that can be stored in the San Andreas to break us off and force us into the sea. It's just uh, Every, you know, we as architects deal with the strength of materials all the time, and uh, the strength of materials, we know what the, for instance, the strength of steel is. Uh, we use A36 steel, we use A992 steel. A36 steel has a yield point of 36,000 uh, PSI, A992 steel has a yield strength of 50,000 PSI, but it has an ultimate 
in a rupture strength that's yeah. much greater than A36 has a ultimate strength of about 58,000 psi in a rupture strength because you know, it falls off. Uh, it falls off to its rupture. <coughs> uh, concrete does the same thing. Glass does the same thing. Wood does the same thing. Everything has a yield strength. Not everything. One thing I mentioned just a second. Uh, 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 a yield strength, a rupture strength, or a ultimate strength, and a rupture strength. Everything that we build follows that pattern. Some of those things are very close together, and things like steel is very far apart. Uh, rocks are no different. Rocks have exactly that, and it's that rupture strength that causes the earthquake. And when they rupture, that's what creates the earthquake. But you can't store enough energy in the rocks to create this thing falling into the, into the ocean, because it's all crust. The oceanic crust is connected to the continental crust. We're plowing it, we're plow into it, but we're still connected to it. So absolute zero possibility. Can little pieces of cliff fall off in the, into the ocean? Yeah, that can happen. It happens daily. Drive up to yeah. uh, San Luis Obispo and along Pismo Beach in that area, you can see all the sea cliffs that are shedding. And there, uh, 30 years ago, uh, uh, you can, there's a motel out there, but you can walk 100 feet away from the motel, and now it's within about 20 feet uh, of the walls of the motel. They just, about 10 years ago, built a giant seawall on that to hopefully stop it. Uh, I'm just curious, if they haven't drilled the crust, how do they know all that knowledge about... We were really, 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 really worried about the Russians back in the 1950s. And what were we worried about the Russians? That they were going to get the atomic bomb and then the hydrogen bomb. So our government poured a whole bunch of money in the late 40s and early 50s into geophysics and this young, fledgling science of seismology. And, uh, and uh, based on just physics, uh, we have a pretty good idea of where things are. Uh, for instance, uh, you remember maybe back in eighth grade science you know, where you shine a light through a prism and you broke the light into a bunch of different rays? Well, the same thing happens in the earth when you shake the earth. You can divide up the, those waves into different things as they hit different layers. So when you go from uh, the bottom of the crust into the mantle, some funny things happen. So it basically makes a rainbow inside the earth. It's not light. No, it's movement that does that. And the recording instruments were, we would set off, uh, uh, say, uh, the Russians would set off uh, an atomic bomb over here, and we're over here recording it. We would see these funny things as the wave went from the crust into the mantle, into these liquid spots, into the outside of the core, and the inside of the core, and uh, mathematically they have a pretty good picture, but nobody's been there to actually put their finger on it. Uh, but the math and the physics seem to work. We find things are wrong all the time. And, you know, we were convinced. I grew up. If I if I had said that Mars had plate tectonics on a test when I was a geology student, I would have gotten it wrong. Today, I would actually get it wrong if I said that it's not. Because the Cold War had a, some sort of a positive result. Hmm. Say again. Cold the Cold War. War. Had a, some oh yeah, it had some positive. I mean, this was tremendous positive results. Now uh, it helped mining. It helped oil. Now. Uh, uh, it's helped with all of this stuff. Uh, you know, eventually we're going to have it. Other countries have it, uh, and it's saved lives in other countries. Uh, it, it, it actually works. So we certainly will see the benefits of this sooner or later. Thank you very much. Thank you. All done. Thank you. 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 Thank you.